All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbeen.com. Hope you are doing good. Today, this is a very important topic. And some of the folks, some of the cool beans have been sending me messages and commenting on YouTube videos to talk about the cycle threshold for PCR testing and the PCR testing in general. In light of the, um, I believe it is Michael Mina from Harvard University, an epidemiologist, very famous and popular and decorated um, scientist who has been saying that uh, testing, PCR testing is not very useful. So I wanted to make sure that we can look at the PCR testing, the utility of it, the effect of the PCR testing for helping to curtail the uh, spread of the infection or the pandemic, at least in the US. So that is a basic discussion. I'll provide the three things. Number one, what is the recommendation by CDC after the PCR test is positive? What is the utility of PCR test in terms of uh, in the eyes of CDC? Secondly, I'll present what uh, epidemiologists like Michael Mina have been saying. Thirdly, I'll provide my own opinion as well for what I think is the problem at this time for testing or not testing, but what is happening in terms of the spread in the US and the, and the death rate. So with this, let's start. First of all, I'm going to show you what how is it going in the US. So if you see here in the US, we have about 6 million, more than 6 million cases and 189,000 deaths. And if you see here, this is the, the number of deaths on daily basis. If I go to our world in or worldometer, if you see here, the daily deaths here, this is the average. So you can actually see two, um, this is not two waves. It is actually one continuous wave, but it has been biphasic so far. It has two phases that we can see. In the first phase, on average, we were seeing at one point at the peak, we were seeing about 2,000 or more deaths per day. At this time, we are below 1,000 deaths per day um, in the US. The number of new cases are actually increasing. And then if you can see, they are also reducing too, but they are still higher than the new cases that we were seeing in May, April, May timeframe. So in general, the cases are actually spreading. They are infection is spreading or more cases are detected. This is where the, the fight between one person and the other, some saying that we are testing more, some saying that we, are, we have more infection and so on. So regardless of that discussion, we have more tests, more cases. However, I would rather look at this one. So the number of deaths have become half. They have become lower. Still, they are not trending down towards zero very fast as they could have been for an advanced country like us in the US. Now, this is the basic, um, basic article that has started this discussion, which I, then I had to talk about it today. And that is in the, I believe it is New York time. Your coronavirus test is positive maybe it should not be. So now let me explain where we stand. What's happening is that there are two school of thoughts at this time. On one end, there is a school of thought and it is correct. And that is that, hey, we should be able to test more one and we should be able to get the results rapidly so that we know if somebody is infected or not. So the home-based test, or fast point of care test are very, very important. That is one school of thought. That is Michael Mina and other epidemiologists. With this, they also have one more thought, and that is that the cycle threshold of RT-PCR should not be 40, it should be 30. And I'll explain what does that mean. But what they're saying is, in general, that what we are doing is we are taking somebody's oropharyngeal area uh, cells, and we are amplifying the presence of coronavirus RNA, uh, presence of RNA of the coronavirus so much 
that even if that RNA is broken down and it is of no use and it is an incompetent or non-viable virus, even then we amplify it and then we say, yes, you are positive. And they're saying that is a useless thing. So cycle threshold should be reduced so that some people who have low load of the virus in their upper respiratory tract, they will come back as negative instead of positive. Then CDC has their recommendations that we look at it. I'm providing you a summary of the discussion today. CDC says that the benefit of the testing is to decide when to isolate someone and when not to isolate, when to test someone and when not to retest someone, when someone can go out for working and when they cannot go out for working. So that is the uh, effect that CDC takes out of it. And then finally, my commentary, and then we'll go over the, the discussion today. My commentary is that both of these positions are actually incorrect. Or if I'm not as harsh to say incorrect, I would say lacking. Here is what is lacking. What is lacking is that the outcome of all of this, the testing, May that be low threshold or high threshold, fast testing at home or fast testing at POC or slow testing, whatever that is. The outcome should not be that please isolate yourself and wait for the disease to become severe. If you are lucky and you are in 81% of the people where you would be able to take care of it by yourself, good. And if not, then please end up in the hospital and we would then do a pathetic job with drugs like remdesivir. I think that the correct approach should have been, let's give you prophylaxis. Let's do an aggressive treatment in the beginning. So the clinical outcome should have been the right approach to look at the tests, not who should isolate or not, or not who should have a higher viral load or not. Then what? If you ask me that, Mubin, you have, uh, Corona, SARS-CoV-2, you have COVID-19, stay at home. What have you really helped me with? I understand that I would not go out and transmit it to someone else, fine. But I am not helped. I'm sitting at home and I still might become a serious case. This is where I feel both positions are not right. So now let's very quickly look at the positions. Let's look at the details of this discussion. So let's see here. First of all, if you follow me from here, why test or not? And then how frequently? For example, maybe if I test now and I don't have RT-PCR positive, maybe 12 hours later I will, or 24 hours later I will, or 48 hours later I will, who knows? Because the RT-PCR usually becomes positive somewhere near the symptoms start, or there are some more sensitive tests as well nowadays that can detect five copies. So having a negative RT-PCR today does not mean I cannot catch the virus tomorrow. And this is another flaw in this whole discussion. And that is that serological testing should be mixed with the RT-PCR testing to figure out really what is the situation. And then I think we all know that not only serological testing, that is the blood testing, it's not only the antibodies, we have to look at the T cells as well, and we have to look at the innate arm as well. And then not it's only that the PCR and the serological testing has to be done. We also have to know when to do which test. Antibodies do not start developing until seven to 14 days of the symptoms. So if you start looking at my antibodies on the day one, you will not get any antibodies and you'll say you're fine. So then RT-PCR will be there. But why am I saying this? If you look here, there is a very interesting statement. I cannot imagine the um, why, why CDC is this way. Look at this, correlates of immunity, this is CDC to SARS-CoV-2 infections have not been established specifically, specifically the utility of serologic testing to establish the absence or presence of infection or reinfections remains undefined. 
Can you imagine this CDC saying this, that we don't really know what is the benefit of serological testing? This is CDC, guys. So back here. Should we do RT-PCR testing or not? How frequently? So let's just look at it. Why should we do RT-PCR testing? One reason is political. For example, let's say we have somebody, we have an area where 100 people died. And now the politicians want to show that this is not a big deal. It's a small fraction. What they would say is we should test a million people. And because we tested more, the fraction of people who died compared to the people who confirmed positive are very small. That's a political statement. Otherwise, every single death is an important thing to take care of and to try to prevent. On the other hand, if the testing is low, then if there were 100 people who died and the testing was done, let's say, on 100 people only, and they were all confirmed cases, then it's a 100% death rate, which is really terrible for a politician. So one reason for more or less testing is politics. Another reason, and please, I, I would say this, I, I am on nobody's side, not on Trump's or, or the Democrats or liberals or conservatives, nobody's side. I'm just looking at the data and looking at the, the pandemic, the disease itself. I am a doctor. So look at this economic side as well. What is that? Should we do testing? That means somebody has to pay for those tests. Is it the insurance company? Is it the state? Is it the federal government? Is it, is it me? Who would pay for the test? And if the test need to be done again and again, who's going to pay for that? So there is an economic outcome here. Then there is an operational expense. It's not just that the test has to be paid for. There needs to be the operational uh, um, aspects of it. You have to have testing centers. You have to have staff there. They have to uh, be protected as well. And then they have to carry out the tests as well. So who is paying for this cost as well? So there is an economic outcome as well, which might drive someone to say, do less te testing or do more testing. Then there is a social and epidemiological aspect as well. And that is when the epidemiologists like Michael Mina, they come in and they say, OK, I, I'm going to try to see how prevalent is the disease in a society. Or, for example, for a doctor like me who's trying to figure out, have we reached a herd immunity situation state? So what is the prevalence of the disease and recovery? And then from there, can we open the schools and can we not open the school and all that is there? So that is a social and epidemiological aspect. And then finally, something that is for me the most important thing, that is a clinical outcome. You test someone and then have a clinical outcome ready for them. You tell me this in the US, do we have a clinical outcome ready if somebody is positive? What do we do? Go home, wait. If you have hypoxia, if you have difficulty breathing, then tell. I actually made a call yesterday to my health insurance just to make sure that what are they doing. And the voice uh, um, service that was running simply said, are you concerned about COVID-19? If so, we would only offer test if there is a serious situation. Serious situation, why do you need to test them? Start managing them. Otherwise, we do not offer tests. And if you're concerned, you can call in the doctor to discuss your concern. Otherwise, stay at home. So this is the time. The early phase is when we should aggressively manage. And the whole system is tilted towards trying to aggressively manage at the later stage. That is the wrong part. What has a test to do with that? If you're not going to manage early, then why should we detect early? And there is in this uh, New York, um, in this New York Times. And again, once again, I'm not a New York Times. Somebody sent me this and said, look what they're saying here. I'm not on their side or against them. I'm just you looking at some of the data here. And they have given um, an example here that somebody got the PCR testing done, and they got the results two weeks after. Meanwhile, their quarantine time had become <laughs> had come and gone, right? So, so it is funny that we are doing these kind of things. This is why I actually do not talk about this, because I know 
people are just going to start yelling at me to say, well, don't you understand this? And don't you understand that? I have a very simple answer for all of them. And that is, we have a very high death rate. Do you think that we should have had this many deaths in the US? Compare us to other countries. India has more population. They still have a lower number of deaths. Pakistan has two thirds of the population of the US and higher density. I think the, the total area of Pakistan is equal to one small state of the US. Even then, they have a very tiny number of little number of deaths. Same for many other countries. So back here, um, I had highlighted an area here. You can probably read it. What they were saying was that they got the test result in 20 days. And meanwhile, they had recovered and they were OK. So back here, most important is clinical outcome. If, if today you tell me, and by you, I mean the CDCs and FDAs and the administration and the, uh, and the health insurances, if you tell me that if your test is positive, we are going to do everything to give you hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin or or maybe budesonide or vitamins and supplements and aggressively treat you in the beginning, for all purposes, do more testing. I would love it. But what kind of a joke is this, that you test someone with positive and then say, OK, go home and isolate yourself. I understand it. It has a value of not spreading the virus. Get it. But you have to protect that person and, and save their life as well, who you just found out to be positive. Continuing. Types of tested tests. The types of tests are, of course, we know RT-PCR or PCR is one test that is antigen test, then antibody tests or the serological test, which CDC says there is, we are not clear what is the benefit of serological testing. I cannot imagine the look at this. So before you think that I'm just ranting here. Correlations uh, correlates of immunity to SARS-CoV-2 infection have not been established. Specifically, the utility of serological testing to establish the absence or presence of infection or reinfection remains undefined. They do not know that if antibodies are present or not present, can we successfully say somebody was infected or not in infected? Do you know why they are saying this? Because they believe that the antibodies decay in three months which is incorrect. And there are ample studies that show antibodies would continue. So if I was infected today, 10, 15 days after, if I'm not immunocompromised, my system is going to make antibodies or it is going to make T cells. If not, I'm not a child. If I'm a child, then in 50% of the cases, innate arm will be working. Even then they say, we, we have no idea. I, I'm not a fan of CDC, as you can tell. So antibodies is another test. Then T cell, you can do ELISA testing or some other ways to amplify the T cells and then recognize them. They are not in the medical field. They are mostly in the research field. Innate arm functions, and you can look at the function of the neutrophil and the count of the neutrophil and the macrophages and their function. So these tests all together can really tell from an epidemiological point of view what is the state of the, the uh, system. From a clinical point of view, when once you see somebody with the symptoms, nowadays you should assume it is um, coronavirus. But once again, let's say I look at somebody. I see their symptoms of COVID-19. In the US, what tools do I have other than asking them to go home and wait? Nothing. Hydroxychloroquine is taboo. Ivermectin is a taboo. Um, giving budesonide can become an, um, an issue. So there are, there is from a centralized guidance point of view, there is lots of challenge. And I, I want to show you an example of this. And that example was so interesting for me to look at. And that is, look at this. So the this person or this the folks who wrote this article, they reached out to FDA and they reached out to CDC to say, what do you think should be the cycle threshold? And we'll talk about cycle threshold in a second. What should be the cycle threshold, 40 or 30? And look at what they said. 
The Food and Drug Administration said in an emailed statement that it does not specify the cycle threshold ranges used to determine who is positive and that commercial manufacturers and labs set their own. This is FDA's standing. Now look at the CDC's response. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention said it is examining the use of cycle threshold measures for policy decisions. The agency said it would need to collaborate with the FDA and device manufacturers to ensure the measures can be used properly and with assurance that we know the, what, what they mean. Do you know this is classic finger pointing and somebody else's responsibility? CDC is saying we need to talk to FDA. FDA is saying we don't really care. It is really the manufacturers who should decide. So who is really going to decide it? Nobody. This is the level of, I do not want to say incompetence. I think it is indifference. I think that they can't wait for this to blow over and automatically just go away. And they don't have to do much other than just putting those weird articles up, not in the New York Times on the CDC on site where they say, we do not know what is the benefit of serological testing. I think they're just sitting somewhere, closing their eyes, probably head in there in the sand and just waiting that this should just go. We should not be able to do more work. And I'm sorry, I'm so angry about all these things. This is why I tried not to talk about the situation here. So type of tests, PCR. So let's now continue here. The discussion of the cycle threshold of 40 or 30. Once again, yes, 30 is fine. What we mean by low threshold is this. If I go here for a second, let's say this is the, this is the PCR machine. What you do is you take a sample from the person and that sample has a few RNAs in it from the virus. So let's say five copies of virus. You put that sample in this machine and with, with each cycle, and I have done a detailed discussion of RT-PCR. I don't want to do it over here again. It is in one of my videos. With each cycle, the RNA is amplified. The number of RNAs are copied and they are amplified. So they become more. Then the next cycle, they become more. Imagine they keep becoming double. So first they were five and then they become 10 in the next cycle and then they become 20 and then they become 40 and then they become 80. And so every cycle keeps amplifying them. So how many cycles should we have to continue to amplify? Nowadays, 40 cycles are used, but Michael Mina and other folks are saying, well, we should just use 30. That means even if this, the quantity of the virus was 1,000 times lesser than what we declare positive today, we will not declare them positive. Even, sorry, quantity of the virus will have to be 1,000 times more for somebody to be declared positive. So my question to you is this. Fine, I understand what Dr. Meena is saying. Should we not actually first test that somebody who is at the cycle threshold 30 negative, will they develop the symptoms? Will they develop the antibodies? Should we not take 10, 20, 30 people and do that testing before we say in a sweeping statement that it should be 30? or it should be 40 for that matter. This 40 is an arb arbitrary number as well. It's highly sensitive. And do you know what is the problem with the sensitivity? They're saying that the cycle threshold of a higher number is showing people to be positive who may just have some fragments of RNA. And now we are doing contact tracing and we are asking them to isolate. Man, really, in the US, what are we really doing? Do you think that the number of deaths that we are seeing and the cases that we are seeing, we are really helping a lot of our community? So, but anyways, this is what the recommendation for the cycle threshold is. So back here, CDC says, we don't care it is manufacturer's issue. They decide. Epidemiologists and virologists are saying, bring it down to 30 so that we become less sensitive and the people who may have broken RNA just sitting in there for some time, they are not included. Fine, I understand the logic here. The problem is speed of obtaining the result, as I just said. And secondly, once you have the result, what are we gonna do with it? It's not, it's not a trophy to say I am positive. 
we need to manage them. Then <clears throat> let's just very quickly look at this phases of the COVID-19 testing and what happens. And now I'm using this article from CDC. I would love you to please read this article. It is interesting. It's not all bad, but it is kind of weird. Um, <clears throat> this article is where they're saying that what is the, the criteria for isolation or stopping the isolation in light of the testing of the PCR. So what I have uh, put over here is not exactly in their terms, but in my terms, which kind of overlap with them, that the person who is going through the phase of COVID-19, there is a phase of asymptomatic state or mild symptomatic, then moderate to severe, and then persistent or long hauler. What they're saying is, and look at this, this now, this is where their basis for their discussion or the recommendation will go to CDC's recommendation. They are saying that studies have found that when somebody becomes symptomatic, then 10 days after they do not have enough viral load in their nasopharyngeal area to be able to have a viable virus or a virus that can cause infection even when the person is still going through the disease. That is what is the basic point of view. Why are they putting that forward? They are saying, based on this, they're making a recommendation that if you develop the symptoms today, we are asking you to stop your isolation 10 days after, unless you are immunocompromised or patient does not have the symptoms resolved. If a patient was healthy patient, then 10 days after the onset of the symptoms, it is okay to stop the isolation and go back to work. That is what they're saying. This is in contrast to WHO's um, recommendation where they had said that symptoms su should subside, X-ray should become clear, two RT-PCR consecutive should become negative for some someone to go out. So CDC is saying that there are some people who would not become positive for three months, sorry, negative for three months after the ending of the symptom because they have persistent viral broken pieces. And so we can't just keep asking them to stay home for three months. So just know that after 10 days of onset of symptoms, you are not shedding anymore, go out and start working. That's one of their recommendation. Second recommendation is that if somebody is immunocompromised, then it is possible that for 10 to 20 days after the onset of symptoms, they still may be shedding. So for immunocompromised patients, they recommend to talk with their doctor and then decide when to stop isolation or not. Then what they're saying is six days after the illness, nobody is contagious. So if I develop symptoms today, six days after I'm not contagious, this is CDC. And I have put the point numbers here so that you don't you don't kill me for doing these discussions so see they have point numbers point number one two three four five six so <laughs> excuse me uh, in california here uh, i think we have two million acres burnt which is a record in history so the the whole valley is full with smoke so <clears throat> my apologies for for some time. Okay, so this is point number two. This is point number three. Point number four in their article that they're making is that after the recovery, people may still have RNA up to 12 weeks in their nasopharyngeal area, which is not a competent virus, but it is just broken pieces. And it is an interesting thing that they say, we don't know why there are broken pieces. They, they don't know why there are broken pieces, but they think there are broken pieces. So do not consider this to be a viable virus. This is a broken virus. It's not going to make others sick. So you're fine. Just go out and start working. Don't care for the RT-PCR positive. That is four point. And look, I'm, I partially, partially agree with them. There are some things that are not still known, but there are some things that are known, which somehow CDC doesn't know. Five. Point number five on their side, RNA detection. <laughs> Once somebody has become recovered, they may still have persistent symptoms. 
for from CDC's point of view, up to three more months, I feel that long haulers can be more. Up to three more months. During this time, they're saying that they may have the virus particles or the RNA. But they're saying it may be reinfection. Uh, I can't imagine that they actually said we are not sure about reinfection either. We think for three months somebody cannot be reinfected. Do you know what is, I think, what is this based on? Somebody cannot be reinfected for three months. That study that said that after three months, the antibodies start decaying. Can they not read the other studies that show that that is not the case? And even after the decay, there are more cells that would start making antibodies that would give protection. And in the old SARS of one time, old time, we were able to get protection for two to three years. And this is what is going to happen with this virus too. They have not read that. So they came back and they said, we know for three months you're OK. So hopefully no reinfection for three months. This is our CDC. This is not some lab or some tiny clinic uh, on, in the next corner of the neighborhood. I think even those clinics do a better job. So this is CDC number five. So if you see here, number five, specimen from patients who recovered from an initial COVID-19 illness and subsequently developed new symptoms and retested positive by RT-PCR did not have replication competent virus detected. So if somebody became OK, then had the RT-PCR positive, their virus is not competent to cause infection. The risk of reinfection may be lower in the first three months after initial infection may be lower in the first three months is what their statement is maybe lower. They're not sure. Based on limited evidence from another bacterial uh, coronavirus, H, H cov human coronavirus, the genus to which SARS-CoV-2 belongs, they should have actually looked at SARS-CoV-1 and then talked about it. But they went to human coronavirus. Anyway, so I hope you're you're able to see how how less valuable, how valueless is these. I, I was going to curse, but um, how less valuable are these recommendations? Then, so check this out. Believe me, I believe that if the cool beans sat down and they wanted to create a protocol and a recommendation, they would have written better than what we are seeing here. Look at this. <clears throat> they are saying caveat, so the limitations. Limitations are that there are some limitations here, fine, uh, some people who were infected and in one case report, a person was mild ill. I want to talk about the last two. Data currently available are derived from adults. CDC is saying we are making recommendations, but this is only after looking at the data from adults. We do not know about infants and children. CDC does not know about infants and children. Do you know what they'll be saying for pregnant women, infant and children? I'm sure they'll be saying we are still collecting data. We are still looking at the evolving literature. What are they doing? <laughs> Having tea? <laughs> so, the, so the children and infants data is not available. More data are needed concerning viral shedding in some situations, including in immunocompromised patients. I agree with that. I feel that that is fine. But who is going to go collect that data? So if you look at their recommendation or their, their whole discussion over here, it is really adults which no immuno uh, comorbidities involved, no children or infants in, involved, a smaller segment of the population is what they're talking about. And if you look at these studies here, these studies are not even for the US population. Many of them are actually for the foreign populations. CDC did not even have, or whoever is responsible here, that is NIH or CDC or FDA or all of them together, or Dr. Mubeen maybe, we never started any trials here, data collections here, to make sure we understand our own people and the disease spread here. 
assessment. So with those data points, here is the assessment. They are saying the etiology of this persistent detectable SARS-CoV-2 RNA has yet to be determined. Do you know what they're talking about here in this one? They are saying we have seen some people to continue to have the virus RT-PCR positive after the infection. So look, someone like Mubin can sit and say, maybe then I am more ignorant and that is why I'm more brave in making these statements. That it could be a carrier state. It could be a poor immune system's behavior. It could be that somebody got re-exposed and their nasopharyngeal area has the virus which our body is going to take care of and we will not become infected. It could be the symptoms, not the RT-PCR. The symptom may be because our immune system is dysregulated and so many more other things I've talked about long haulers. CDC says the persistence of SARS-CoV-2, we don't know why. Human coronaviruses and the coronaviruses are not new thing. They have been here for decades with us. Books are full of information about these things. They say, we don't know. Studies have not found evidence that clinically recovered persons with persistence of viral RNA have transmitted SARS-CoV-2 to others. So what they are saying is that if somebody had recovered, they still have virus, good thing they will not be making others infectious. I want to ask them, how about that person who is st stuck in this miserable state? Have you done anything about them? But anyways, they say, well, they're not going to be contagious. Okay. These findings strengthen the justification. Now look at the justification. These findings strengthen the justification for relying on a symptom-based rather than test-based strategy for ending the isolation. This is what their gist is. They are saying, when you see your symptoms are done, and there is 10 days past the start of the symptoms, forget about the testing, just go out, do your work. You're fine. This is what they're trying to say. So the person who are by current evidence no longer infectious are not kept unnecessarily isolated and excluded from work or other responsibilities. So they are partially correct here. Partially correct is this. There are some people whose RT-PCR continues to stay positive. My, my dudes have a guidance to say, if somebody continues to stay positive after one month or two months, they are fine. They can go back. But for anybody else who wants to go back, we want to have an RT-PCR, which is negative. How difficult is that to say? They're saying just don't bother about the testing. And I'm okay with the testing after the fact to less bothered to be less bothered about that because it is really the antibody and T cell testing, which is more important and less important is the RT-PCR. RT-PCR is more important in the beginning and fast in the beginning with a preparation for medical outcome for which we have dropped the ball. We do not know what to do. I think Dr. Zelenko should start leading the community, the whole uh, medical system here to take care of the pandemic. He knows better for how to handle than these folks. So with this, this is also interesting. This is about reinfection. <clears throat> Do you know that they say, we really don't know if somebody can be reinfected or not. So <laughs> they, they are. They are funny. So they're saying here, if such a person, so a person who has become recovered, if such a person remains asymptomatic, asymptomatic during the 90 day period, then any retesting is unlikely to yield any useful information, even if the person had been in close contact with the infected person. Somebody who became infected and recovered, they're saying for 90 days, don't need to test them, even if you come in contact, because they think for 90 days, the Reinfection would not happen. Again, why do they think that? Because they think that for 90 days, antibodies stay and then they decay. 
<laughs> so after 90 days or during the 90 days, if the person becomes symptomatic again, and we cannot find another reason for their symptoms, then they're saying, OK, do the RT-PCR once again. I would have added a caveat over here. And again, I don't mind people getting uh, tested again and again. We should have the home testing very soon. But we should not become reinfected until there is an issue with the immune system. So if somebody is reinfected or they have the virus again, they should actually go and be concerned about their immune system that why is it not working correctly? Or is it that the immune system is taking care of the virus, but not just through the antibodies, maybe through innate arm or the, the cytotoxic T cells and the virus load is just present. And I have read this statement a couple of times. Now let's look at the recommendations. What, what do they mean by all of this? They are saying after 10 days of symptoms, you can start going out. Clinical signs and symptoms are more important than the tests. Forget about the test. Look at your signs and symptoms. Stop isolation 10 days after the onset of symptoms. Stop isolation after 10 days of positive PCR. So if you didn't have a symptom, but you suspected that you were in contact and you may be positive, then if you have done the PCR and PCR became positive, then 10 days after that, you're fine. Test-based strategy only for immunocompromised. So to decide when to stop the um, isolation, that strategy, which is based on RT-PCR becoming negative, they're saying, don't do that only for immunocompromised. For uh, other people, 10 days afterwards, you're fine. Retesting after discontinuation of isolation. So do not need to do retesting after you have discontinued. So some of these are good. Some of these, for example, their confusion on reinfection it doesn't make sense. Their confusion on why the RNA pieces are still there doesn't make sense. Um, so some of these things are not very interesting. With this, I want to now show a couple of more things here. So what is the takeaway over here? The takeaway is testing should be done if we are prepared with medically to respond. If you're not prepared medically, then what is really the benefit of testing? That is my opinion. CDC says, Test only to decide if you're going to isolate or not. Epidemiologists are saying reduce the cycle threshold so you do not make so many people positive and you do not have to do contact tracing and isolating them. So these are the three uh, opinions. My opinion, epidemiologists and CDC. Look at this. Uh, this is also New York Times. Fast, less accurate coronavirus test may be good enough. And I agree with this. What they're saying is those home-based fast testing, which I have their site over here. Uh, I think it's in the, um, in the description. So there is a company who's making a test that can be done at home. We should accelerate their function, their work. We should give them a grant, make them have them be able to produce a test at a mass scale and send it out to, out to as many people as we can. Put them out on the stores where you go out for gas stations and others and just put them there. We are not doing those things. So here, this article, they say that, hey, we should have some way of testing fast and maybe at home. Oh, this is the one where I was talking about 20 days, 22 days later, they got the test results. So this is another interesting article. Then here, CDC's clarification. This is the latest thing from CDC. CDC's clarification on coronavirus virus testing offers more confusion. So this is the gentleman who confused us. And the here is what they said. Guidelines asserted. <laughs> I can't imagine see, it, it is these things are coming from CDC. Guidelines asserted that people who had been in close contact with an infected individual typically defined as being within six feet of a person with a coronavirus for at least 15 minutes, do not necessarily need a test if they do not have a symptom. This is CDC. Then they fixed it. And they said, administration official said that not necessarily 
needing a test was consistent with may be considered <laughs> for one. So they're saying, OK, please, re you don't be upset. Do not say do not necessarily need a test. Replace that with may be considered to have a test. This is CDC saying maybe you should have it. They, they're not clear. Again, if there was a clinical approach available, I would ask people to test. So now the question is, with all this uh, mess here that you're seeing, why to test and why to test fast? If we have home-based fast tests, cheap, that we could test every day, maybe. Then the people who have become sick at least would definitely know they are sick. And then they can definitely go to their doctor and say, I am sick, I have it positive. And seek some help. Again, I keep becoming, I keep becoming stopped at this level that what help are they going to get other than saying, go home and sit down and wait for it to either go away or become severe. But if we have a right approach, to say when somebody becomes positive, start giving them this vitamin and this vitamin and this drug and this drug and pro give them an oximeter and ask them to look at their oxygen levels and they come in at this level and they, we start giving them steroids at this time, just like a math plus protocol maybe. Then I would say, yeah, sure, do these tests. They're going to help. Otherwise, you're only going <coughs> to excuse me, frustrate the people. So this is the discussion for today. My um, apologies. I am a little upset with the way we are led at this time in the presence of so much right things, methods available to us that can be used. And we keep, to me, it looks like we in the US, the at the administrative level, the health administrative level, have you seen those little cartoons sometimes where there is a little kitty or something that has gotten itself stuck in those uh, cotton ball and it's all stuck in there? To me, it looks like we have uh, gotten ourselves stuck in those red tapes and commercial interests and party align alignments and those things. And we have gotten ourselves stuck and we've caused we have ended up with lots of lives lost. And I don't think that we are reaching a point. This reduction in the death cases, uh, rate of death, is not because somebody is really managing. It is because the herd immunity is developing. It is because people are becoming more aware. It is because people who are vulnerable, they are keeping themselves safe. It is because maybe T cell immunity is developing. It is because maybe innate arm is helping in some cases. It is not that there is some miraculous work that is happening, that is helping. These guys, CDCs, CDCs, FDAs, they are just not there. So this is what we have today. Thank you very much. Apologies. I would take some pieces out if I could, uh, this a long video, and we will talk again tomorrow. Please um, like, subscribe, and share, and I would see you tomorrow.